discussion portion of today's event. Uh, Dr. Richard Yan is currently the CTO of Fortune uh, Precision Equipment Corporation, uh, responsible for central R&D and product engineering in semiconductor equipment components. Prior to Fortune, uh, Richard was a senior director at Intel. His team uh, has won numerous honors, including Intel China Award and Intel Achievement Award. Uh, prior to that, Richard was a senior engineering manager at LAM Research and group leader at Applied Materials. Richard has been working through the ecosystem of semiconductor manufacturing supply chains from fab process equipment uh, to components. Richard received Bachelor of Engineering from Zhejiang University and PhD from University of California, San Diego in material science and engineering. He is a lifetime member of CASPA and has served as executive director of the symposium. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome Richard Yan. Thank you, Waylon. Thank you, William, for the warm introduction. Uh, and also, thank you, Ian and the symposium team organized uh, uh, one for events. And we held the, uh, 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 I just noticed we took a brief note uh, about the, the speaker, we cover uh, the access and all the way from uh, the materials, uh, fab equipment, uh, and also we have good representations of IC design. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, all the way to to, to the uh, final uh, electronics and systems. Um, so I think in the next uh, uh, forty minutes, uh, probably we can only can only spare uh, forty minutes uh, in our panel discussion. So I would like to uh, the get our uh, uh, speakers warm up again, uh, and then also other audience, please uh, stay uh, through. Uh, the, the time is pretty precious. Uh, so we like to uh, organize into uh, uh, three sessions. Uh, the first one, we'll go through the round table introduction uh, about the, the speakers uh, uh, again, and then uh, talk about what is the Mac trend uh, each of the speakers has seen in their uh, uh, segments uh, of the ecosystem. And then the second uh, session, we we'll spend time on a few uh, focus topics uh, that we have uh, gathered. Uh, and then the last and not least, uh, we'll save time uh, to take uh, 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 a few questions from the audience. I could see that very uh, the active participation in the uh, chat room. I would like to you to remain uh, in the panel discussion uh, and like to hear from the speakers on the question that you have raised. Uh, the, so uh, let's see here. The, all the speakers, could you turn on uh, your uh, voice and video? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Great, Rob. Uh, we have Rob. Uh, do we have Tad back? Tad, uh, is Tad I'm uh, here. Uh, still? I'm here. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and then we have uh, Hui Min. Yes. All right. Uh, Frank, Frank, are you on? Okay, uh, yeah, well, let's the uh, uh, Alex, uh, please try to pin uh, Frank if it's uh, not there. Uh, so I'm uh, going through a bit introduction about uh, uh, stuff for myself. Uh, so I have been working uh, the uh, uh, in the segment of uh, fab manufacturing uh, equipment, uh, and currently, uh, my role is in the uh, components uh, and uh, 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 at components level and materials level. The, so before my uh, before my uh, the uh, previous work, uh, I had been uh, working at uh, uh, the uh, applied materials uh, in the equipment uh, on the deposition equipment, and then at the uh, lamp research working on the edge equipment. Uh, when I joined the Intel. Uh, the uh, working on 3D NAND process development. Uh, so the trend that I have seen uh, overall is in my last uh, uh, the 20 years in the semiconductor uh, industries that I have seen very clear trend is the, and I have experience, personal experience is the process node has uh, evolving from 
planner to 3D. Uh, the, the first spot evolution was uh, the, uh, the, the flash uh, NAND process. Uh, starting from 2012, uh, that we see the first production uh, of the 24 layers of uh, the uh, 3D NAND. And I was uh, personally involved in the process tool development and has been a great transition. Uh, and we see many the uh, new market leaders in this segment uh, emerge uh, and also the, uh, it dramatically reduced the cost per bit for our storage. Uh, so that's what's one of trend. And the second segment I've seen in the logic, uh, the, uh, so I was uh, uh, involved in uh, the gate around uh, selective edge tool design for gate around in 2015. Uh, 2015, and had a brief, uh, uh, I think, OLAP with the Hui Min's team in Albany. Uh, and I was, uh, as Albany, as uh, Hui Min uh, projected uh, the vertical the integration, uh, the gate all around, uh, as uh, IBM has demonstrated, this is the second trend we have seen. And I will, see, I will say that uh, DRAM, uh, DRAM is uh, probably the third major chip technology or if, uh, uh, start from the, uh, the uh, I mean, they will start from the same strategy from 2D to 3D NAND. Uh, again, it's a great uh, uh, opportunity for the, uh, for the folks in this ecosystem, right? To be, uh, to have the technology innovation and uh, uh, take the lead uh, in the technology uh, innovation. And that's opportunity for the new market leader to emerge. Um, that's the first uh, trend I have seen uh, from the perspective of uh, process equipment, uh, and then second uh, one is more recent. Uh, you can see that chips shortage, uh, that's from, and then you see everything, everything shortage, including the, uh, the, uh, the uh, we have the capacity, fab capacity shortage, we have the equipment shortage, and now we see more uh, the, that is there's component shortage. Uh, you, can, uh, you can have uh, the, uh, uh, the billions of order piled up, uh, it's all held up because of the uh, components. We don't have the generators. We don't have the, the uh, special parts. Uh, and that's what I uh, see as uh, uh, more on the business trend. And, and there's more consolidations in the components uh, that's uh, evolving. Uh, the less of the consolidation in the chip manufacturers, we start to see more very active uh, the, uh, the uh, business consolidations in the components and materials segments. And this is also an opportunity that uh, put our Silicon Valley spread into, uh, into work, uh, that uh, we could uh, have uh, technology innovations combined with the uh, new capital investments. Uh, maybe that's an active uh, uh, component, uh, uh, the development. Uh, and that's why I uh, personally uh, that uh, uh, jumped in this uh, stream lane uh, as a CTO in Fortune. Uh, so, uh, so that's the two trends I have seen. Uh, and I, uh, and then I'd like to, uh, next one is introduce uh, uh, Ted Spear. Uh, Ted has been in this industry uh, more than 20, more than 20 years, uh, more than uh, I have seen. Uh, and uh, Ted, uh, from your, your speech, I think you have been very active uh, advocate for risk five, uh, but your experience is more than that. Uh, would you speak a bit about your experience and what do you see as a Mac, uh, Trend in the segments that you have been working on. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, amazing lineup of talks uh, you had today. Uh, congratulations to the to the organizers. Uh, uh, re really enjoyed listening to all of them. So, you know, good job there. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, don't know how to address uh, all your questions exactly. Uh, so, I've been involved in. Uh, FPGAs uh, since uh, <laughs> 20 years behind. <laughs> 1987 is when I think when I uh, joined uh, Actel at the time. So I've been at the same place, uh, uh, but always moving. I, I, I would say uh, so. Uh, we're not the number one supplier of, of FPGAs, but I've, I'll, doesn't mean I, I don't want to become the number one supplier of FPGAs. So we're always looking for ways to to be disruptive, and so. I was kind of primed uh, to to uh, jump on risk five as, as soon as I saw it, and you know, to take the opportunity, and definitely feel like, uh, uh, you know, that's that's definitely going well, and 
has exceeded everyone's expectations. And, uh, but I, you know, still there, there, there's definitely still work to be done. And, you know, part of the, you know, opportunity today definitely is uh, to, to make appeals for people to, uh, uh, you know, continue to support RIS-5 and, and help us with, with, with our effort. Because I really do feel like, uh, you know, with trends I cited there that, that RIS-5 has, uh, has a significant role to play and is already playing a significant role in uh, solving the uh, next generation uh, compute problems. So, and then, you know, we're definitely as a FPGA organization, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, we're, we're walking the walk. We, we, we used, uh, we used RISC-V and it, what it really did uh, for us was, uh, uh, you know, gave us the opportunity to innovate so we could work with a supplier and, and, make, and make changes to microarchitecture uh, as needed to, you know, to to meet certain needs of our customers, the area of uh, uh, in this case was uh, reliability. But you're going to see an ec ecosystem of uh, risk five suppliers, and so if you're building a system today, you're going to want some customization, and uh, you're not limited to one supplier. There's many suppliers, uh, uh, strong suppliers today that can can help you solve your your own problems uh, uh, with risk five. I'm not sure I answered your question exactly. All right, it had, yeah. Uh, this, the, yeah, we are, we'd like to you to share the, what do you see as back chain uh, in the field that you have been working on for over tw uh, two decades? Uh, say that again? Uh, yeah, we, you, 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 have, you, you have speak to, to the question that I had. Thank you, okay. Ted. Yeah. All right, okay, so our next uh, the, our panelist is uh, Rob Main. Uh, Rob uh, has been uh, uh, today has been a great advocate for open source. Uh, Ted, would you like to um, uh, Rob? Could you speak to uh, that? Uh, introduce a little bit of your background again, and uh, speak to what is the Mac trend that you have seen uh, in the segments that you have been uh, working on. Sure, happy to, and uh, congratulations again on the uh, excellent. Uh, seminar this afternoon. I, I truly enjoyed the uh, breadth and depth of the uh, papers or talks that were given. So very, very enjoyable. Uh, so I've been fortunate uh, in my career that I've gotten to work on a lot of uh, different challenging problems with many talented people. I've worked in the area of uh, design for test, built and self-test, uh, static timing analysis, uh, optimization, transistor level analysis, to name a few. And those have all been done in conjunction and that's primarily all in EDA development, but also hardware design early in my career in terms of built and self-test. But that's all been uh, in conjunction with uh, chip design teams. So as a result of that experience, initially at IBM, but then extending into Sun Microsystems and Oracle, uh, it uh, gave me an opportunity to work very closely both with software developers and EDA but also with chip design teams closely to be able to understand their problems up front and then be able to implement algorithms to help solve their problems in a timely fashion. And certainly Magma gave me an opportunity to have a startup experience as part of my career and to understand the challenges uh, in developing solutions very quickly for customers who were you know, waiting for those to uh, help build the company. So that was all a great experience. Open source is, is a unique opportunity, I think, for to help build a collaborative ecosystem, similar to what, uh, you know, originally like I used to see at IBM, except for it was all within one company. I know from my experience back then, and maybe it's still true, I don't know, but there was always a person at IBM you could contact at another site or an IBM research who would know the answer to the question. And that was a tremendous resource, as, as I fondly recall. I think open source allows for an opportunity for collaboration amongst individuals from different backgrounds or different companies or different universities to be able to participate together to solve complex problems. And I think that's going to help break down barriers and help faster innovation as we go forward. It's going to take time though for that to occur because as I mentioned in my chat, there obviously are different barriers to entry for that. And some of those barriers are needed, of course, as, as we saw earlier in the talk by Huiming of the research 
that's ongoing at IBM at Albany, right? It, that takes tremendous amount of talent, tremendous amount of resource in terms of both financial or capital investment, if you will. And then also to build the EDA ecosystem around that to design enablement, that takes a lot of money and talent too, right? But I hope that we can, over time, enable that to be more collaborative in nature for a broader community. So we'll see how this goes. It's gonna take time. It took time in software. So, but I am optimistic that it will occur. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Uh, next one, uh, I'd like to bring, uh, bring Huimin back to give a brief introduction and what you see as the Mac trend uh, in your segment. Thanks, Richard. By the way, thanks to Caspar for inviting me to be uh, with uh, this audience and also with uh, my fellow speakers. It has been a wonderful experience to hear the talks and uh, have some interaction here. Uh, Richard, one thing I do want to uh, echo uh, is what you have said on that 3D component. Uh, yes, I, I see that started with NAND. I see that starting to uh, be there in logic and I see the D rank is also falling. So that's actually a very great trend. I call it a Z direction, the vertical direction. We haven't used a lot in the, uh, in the past. Now we are exploring that direction, which is not constrained by so-called lateral scaling component of it. The second one I indicated, but I want to share a little more on this, is uh, chip and the chip technology. Uh, essentially, what we see here is uh, in the next five to 10 years before the next uh, lithography, I mean, intrinsic transistor scaling has been driven by lithography, as we all know. Before the next breakthrough uh, in the patterning lithography capability, I would say chiplet likely uh, is going to play more and more important role. Uh, very likely in the next five to 10 years, chip and the chiplet technology are going to be equally important when it comes to uh, semiconductor uh, logic chips. The third one, um, let me add uh, to this uh, conversation. I mentioned this National Semiconductor Technology Center. Essentially, it's an initiative. Uh, the US wants to revive semiconductor manufacturing and a research leadership uh, in the US. Uh, one thing I've learned, actually really triggered by my ex-IBM colleague, uh, Rob, when he talked about uh, this open uh, software ecosystem. Uh, essentially, this NSTC to a large extent, it's more or less an open hardware innovation platform for semiconductor industry. Maybe I'm going to talk to Bob offline to learn a little bit about his past experience. How do we do this together for semiconductor technology and semiconductor design uh, from an open innovation platform perspective? That's the one thing I want to add uh, to share here with this audience and with Bob as, Rob as well. Oh, thank you, Pemi. Uh, do we have Frank back? Frank, could you speak to a bit of your uh, uh, the is, uh, uh, Frank previously communicated with us that he's not able to uh, make the panel. It's Michael who is uh, able to. Thank you. All right, great. Hey, Michael, yeah, we'd like to bring you back. Uh, the, you just spoke uh, passionately about the testing, uh, but I think you're yeah, more than that, uh, your experience. Uh, could you uh, tell a bit your background and what do you see as a Mac? Uh, chant in uh, the segment that you have served? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate, uh, congratulate the, uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, the CASPER, uh, the key uh, members, and also, you know, everyone. I feel like this is a very, uh, you know, inspirational kind of uh, events. I learned actually a lot um, from both the depth and, the, and also the, uh, the brace perspective, actually. Um, this is a very uh, a good uh, uh, events for me to learn a lot of the, uh, the insight from the different aspect of the semiconductor industry. Um, so, um, so I want to briefly talking about that. Uh, you know, uh, well, myself, I think it's. Uh, um, I recently actually just joined this uh, advent test, and um, you know, and I'm running the advent test the cloud solution business. Um, and, uh, you know, with my background, actually, you know, I was the, uh, uh, before the uh, uh, event test, I was actually, you know, working with uh, uh, quite a few top uh, semiconductor company, helping them to implement those AI machine learning uh, infrastructure. 
Um, and also uh, before that, I was a, a, a co-founder for a, a startup company, you know, focusing on, you know, building those, uh, you know, uh, machine learning, deep learning, you know, infrastructure uh, for the, uh, uh, some of these uh, top leading cloud uh, solution provider. Um, and also before that, uh, I was uh, uh, having this, uh, taking the leadership role in a couple uh, semiconductors, uh, uh, leaders like a Marvell, uh, LSI Logic today becoming Broadcom, and the VTES, the you know semiconductors. Um, so talking about uh, some of the uh, the views from the semiconductor uh, you know industry, I think uh, again I I think I like to continue uh, some of the uh, you know the, the the experience and also the uh, the sharing my view on how can we continue to uh, leverage the uh, uh, the AI and the machine learning. Uh, in, to helping on the uh, semiconductor manufacturing, right? I think uh, uh, in many of the uh, my experience, actually, um, or actually, I can say the ongoing experience uh, with the uh, semiconductor uh, manufacturer, right? We are seeing that. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I'll give you some examples. It's like, for example, um, just like a doctor uh, Bu mentioned, there is that uh, with this uh, heterogeneous uh, computing, right? I mean, we are seeing that uh, this MCM, right, the multi-chip module package kind of a silicon is becoming more popular. And then what we're seeing is that uh, there's a growing demand uh, for those, uh, you know, the, the, the silicon, uh, you know, uh, manufacturer. They want to make sure that the, the, the yield, right, is getting, you know, uh, improved. Mm -hmm. um, in, and uh, specifically talk about within a MCM kind of a package, right? You are talking about 10, 20, sometimes more than 50 chiplets, right? And uh, um, it's not a good idea to to see that the, in the semiconductor final test or the, uh, the the system level test, seeing some MCM package to silicon fail, right? I think it's uh, it's a very uh, cost costly kind of a situation because you are not just uh, uh, I mean it could be just one chiplet inside a let's say a fifty chiplet fail, right? But you are actually losing the opportunity selling selling those silicon. Right, and uh, you know it's it's a it's a also a loss from the manufacturing cost, but also a, a, a losing on the business opportunity, right? So this is where that uh, we are seeing a growing and also a, a strong demand starting to apply data analytics throughout those uh, various manufacturing test stages, right? And specific, specifically is that uh, we talk about the connecting, you know, the data source across the, uh, uh, the semiconductor uh, supply chain, right? And uh, being able to correlate the data, um, you know, from the upstream data to the downstream and uh, being able to find out the source of the problem earlier in the manufacturing cycle. I think this type of the uh, uh, capability, being able to number one, access uh, the data uh, from different stage of manufacturing. And then number two, being able to provide that uh, um, Capability, right? So the uh, the semiconductor, you know, uh, manufacturer, they are able to, you know, using those data to feed for or feedback all those data and being able to analyze. Hey, what would be those uh, potential root cause, right, for that, uh, you know, failed silicon, right? And then, um, and at what stage, right? Out of those, uh, you know, the the 20, 30 chiplets, right? I think uh, package there, right? How do I make sure that from different source, right? I mean, how do I guarantee the total flexibility of those data? How can I make sure that uh, I can using those, uh, uh, you know, uh, machine learning and uh, being able to uh, continue to monitor the quality and uh, being able to provide some insight, right? I mean, to improve those. I think those are the area uh, we are seeing that it's a trend. Uh, it's growing and, uh, you know, it's uh, it's just starting to, you know, not just just the theory, actually, we are seeing many of the power manufacturers are using that technique today. Yeah. yeah. Hey, thank you, Michael. Yeah, yeah, get right, get into the folk, uh, folks topic. Uh, the So uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes, uh, we, uh, I, we selected a few uh, uh, topics uh, we'd like to have uh, the discussion. Uh, so the first one is uh, Michael has just speak a little bit uh, is the uh, is uh, chip lag technology. Uh, now the question is, the, will the chip technology overpace 
uh, chip lab technology or pays the chip technology in delivering the system level performance. Uh, uh, we looking at five years from now. And then this question is first one uh, is for Hui Min. Hey, thanks, uh, Richard, for <laughs> showing that question at me. Uh, well, I have, I do have, um, I do have a research team working on both um, technology fronts. Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, I do have uh, most of the team actually today still work on chip technology. Uh, a relatively small but a growing size of the team, significant growing size of the team on the chip technology. Um, when I look at the, there are two components here. One is will chip technology and move continue to move forward. My answer is definitely yes. Will the return of that investment start to flatten out? The answer is also yes. Then you look at the return of that investment in the chip technology space, especially in the next uh, five to ten years, with outpace from a $1 average perspective in terms of return, my assessment is soon that two curves will cross. But it depends on the speed of that or the pace of that cross points will depend on the application. Likely that cross point will be lower in terms of the entry level for low power and mobile application. It will get a little bit higher bar when it comes to AI and high performance application, but eventually it will all catch up. The second component I want to add here is more like, when I look at these technologies, we need like work like a human being with two legs, chip and a chiplet. The reason I say that, if you look at the nature of how we integrated these things, I would say they are very much complementary, and we need the strengths, we needed the advancement in both technologies to move forward. One beautiful thing about heterogeneous integration is not just it's about a technology. It's actually, if you think about it, it's a key enabler. Eventually, I think in the next five to 10 years, likely, it can enable a heterogeneous computing architecture. Very different than today's uh, von Neumann a computing architecture possible. So that's the direction that we are. I think our industry needs to be heading. That's how I call heterogeneous integration is enabling technology. It enables the industry to build something very different than today. So let, uh, let me just uh, pause here. Hey, thank you, Pemi. Yeah, that's uh, uh, very insightful uh, in terms of speaking to uh, to, 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 to this, the, uh, how it enables the chip, chip architecture and also uh, speaking of the cost per perspective, uh, I think in the end we judge by PPAC may be still relevant. Um, so on the same topic, uh, chip lab technology versus the chip technology, uh, I also like to hear uh, again from our panelists. Yeah, so there uh, was an announcement this last week or something from from Intel. So there, uh, some people should be aware of. It's called UCIE. It's not just Intel, actually. It's a it's a consortium. It's, it's a chiplet technology based on CXL. So members of the consortium are pretty powerful. You got Intel, AMD, ARM, Samsung, TSMC. Uh, so we've already had meetings with them. So it sounds like you know <laughs> that you know it's always been it's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing uh, to 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 uh, you know design your chip uh, based on a chiplet. But you know here's a uh, you know, there, there's definitely a new effort that was that's recently announced that people should be aware of. Our own use, uh, my division, but other divisions of microchip have been kicking the tires. And I know, uh, you know, they always want to go 3D. So, so the Z direction is uh, of interest uh, as well for, for chiplets. So, uh, you know, they see, you know, a lot of benefits uh, for going 3D is much more difficult, I think, to imagine, or it, the, the 2D uh, creates actually problems in architecting the, the overall system for, for those teams. So I think when you can stack, you know, two unlike chips on top of each other, I think that, uh, I don't think, not seeing that we're, we're there yet, but, uh, you know, that's uh, d definitely is a step that we have to head. But I can imagine, uh, 
uh, we introduced, we heard about the, you know, the power underneath the chip. You're going to have to, when you start to have these 3D stacks of chips burning a lot of power, you're going to have to have a, a, a heat exchangers also uh, throughout the throughout the system to suck the power out of that out, out of that stack. But it, you know, it can save power in the end of the day because you're you can, it's much the z direction is much shorter distance for those the electrons to travel than you know all the way across the chip to the next chip thank you ted uh, anyone else like to speak to the uh, what do you see uh, as a chip lab versus chip technology yeah this is uh, rob so i agree with uh, winning's uh, comment relative to that there's going to be advancement both in uh, packaging technology, specifically chiplets, and also in process technology. And that also that there's likely to be more quick advances in the chiplet technology, just because semiconductor uh, research and advancement is such a difficult and challenging problem getting harder as they go along. Uh, I also agree that uh, chiplets by allowing for heterogeneous type of entities to be placed on a, on a higher level package is a real advantage for different developers in the market because it allows you to pre-select IP from different providers and not have to wait for say like a physical macro to be proven in on a new process node by you know, one of your favorite suppliers or by your own R&D team that you can pull into it. So it really does allow for a much easier uh, pick and choose, so to speak, uh, mechanism for developing product. I think that's a huge advantage. And I also say that uh, Years back, uh, these packaging solutions were generally comprised of homogenous type chips. If you look at the uh, IBM mainframe back in the late 70s, early 80s, it was all bipolar. They were TCMs or thermal conductor modules, right? That was all the same underlying chip technology and similar for MCMs too, by and large as well. So I think chiplets really does open up a new game field for all of us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, yeah, I think if you could, uh, this, this, this one is a, uh, it's really a Mac uh, technology trend uh, on the Z direction uh, is, uh, I think personally as a process technology, we feel a lot more to play in a third dimension. Uh, I think probably the same for uh, the IC designers uh, and the end uh, system uh, lab design that's uh, uh, open up a, 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 a new di dimension and more new possibility. Um, the next topic i like to start with Rob is that uh, Rob has been advocating on this open source uh, in terms of the software development. He had great experience. And now you call, the uh, question is now, can the trust be built in open source hardware, IP, and tooling development? That's a great question. So I, I suppose in some ways I've been known to ask hard questions. And so there, you know, yeah. there's no, no secret that there are, are challenges or problems when uh, you're building open any tool or application, right? And then invariably it gets back down to the underlying silicon qualification and what type of test structures that were used for device characterization, for interconnect characterization, et cetera. Uh, what's your collaboration level with the foundry? Those are very important ingredients relative to the physical design tools, logical verification or physical design verification, physical design tools and electrical verification tools. And then also of course the logical verification tools. I think greater progress has been made on the logical verification tools. I think it's on the physical design and associated electrical or physical verification tools in the open source community that is going to be the bigger challenge. There certainly is a lot of effort in that area. Some of that is being funded by the US government, as I mentioned in my slide deck. Uh, I think there's definitely opportunity to help improve this. You know, Perhaps there can be some type of uh, partnership or arrangements to be made with different EDA partners of this scenario, right? And in terms of how that collaboration could look. But again, it is a challenge, of course, because there is a lot of money invested in this, a lot of R&D time. So we will see how this plays out. Mm. Hey, thank you, Rob. The, I also ask, ask, ask uh, uh, the FIMI, uh, the sort of in, uh, in, uh, NSTC that, uh, that you have been championed. Would, it, would that help to enable uh, more open collaborations in terms of the hardware IP uh, development? Uh, that is truly one of our intentions. I think, uh, well, as the way that you have asked the question, there's still a lot of things need to be figured out, especially in the hardware space. 
who owns the IP and what is the sustainable business model based on that IP ownership uh, moving forward. These things we still have to figure out. The way that we, I see this NSTC first is going to be a public private um, ecosystem, uh, which we know how to do. Uh, like today, the Albany facility, Nanotech Center is based on uh, IBM and also uh, New York State uh, NY creates co-owned system. Uh, they are the landlord, uh, but we work together on technology and development. Uh, the second component I do want to add here, which uh, we didn't talk too much, but it's extremely important. Talking about technology innovation, I think in the US now, what we're facing here is really, really the talent pipeline uh, when it comes to hardware technology. I think some of the speakers probably indicated that as well. I think in, under this NSTC, we have a very focused session to, uh, uh, to I would say, grow back that uh, investment and a collaboration between industry and uh, universities. That's extremely important moving forward to build a sustainable model on this uh, platform. Hey, uh, thank you, Pimi. Uh, I think last one, maybe I'll ask Michael, uh, since you have built in uh, ACS uh, cloud-based uh, test platform, you have access to um, a lot of end users results, probably also in the loop of verifying the designs. Uh, what do you see is how to, in part of this uh, ecosystem, how to build the trust uh, in terms of open source uh, hardware development? Yeah, so yeah, that's a that's actually a, a really good question, right? So um, when we talk about the, um, you know, how to do the gold mining, right, for semiconductor, you know, test data, right, and manufacturing data, right? I think one of the, the critical things, right, I think nowadays, right, we, a lot of people is asking me, say, hey, Michael, I think, uh, how come, I mean, uh, we are seeing people are using AI machine learning in different verticals, you know, healthcare, financial, you know, um, you know, in retail, in every aspect, I mean, many vertical industry. How come we are not seeing too much on the semiconductor, especially in the testing space, right? So, so one thing, you know, what we're doing is that, uh, you know, is that the, the source of the data, right? Because uh, there's a couple of things, right? There's a couple of uh, bottlenecks, right? And an uh, um, opportunity for us to, uh, you know, uh, to make it happen, right? Number one is that, the, first of all, the source of the data, as I mentioned, right? Uh, horizontally, I mean, through the semiconductor manufacturing process, you know, from the, uh, the design, uh, you know, to the foundry, uh, to the, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, the all sets, right? I think uh, it could cross different stage, right? And the different vendor and also in different uh, geographic uh, kind of location, right? So, so uh, there's a privacy, there's a, you know, a concern of people, you know, how you share those data, there's a security issue, right? That's number one. And number two is that, uh, um, and also the infrastructure, right? To, to uh, being able to collect the data uh, from you know the uh, uh, different stage of the uh, uh, the manufacturing, right? Um, how do you collect those data from both equipment data, test data, uh, and some of the metadata from different test equipment? And how do you providing those uh, you know the real time low latency type of information and being able to fit into the uh, you know a, a a a repository of the data? I mean you know. Um, how do we build it, right? And then the last but not least is that, the, you know, and once we build it, right, I mean, how do we providing a, a, a robust, uh, you know, uh, analytics kind of a platform, right? Enable the, uh, the data scientist people, right? Um, either from, you know, the ecosystem partners or from our customers or, you know, for the uh, advantage of internal development, right? I think those are the things that the, um, you know, we, that's the things we are focusing on, right? I think, uh, so answer your question, how do we, you know, um, supporting more innovation, right? I mean, in a, and encourage the ecosystem, you know, to participate is that uh, uh, we are, uh, as we speak, right? We are building the so-called uh, uh, the, the data superhighway, right? So basically, uh, given that the Adventist is the, uh, the market leader in the semiconductor you know, test industry, right? I think we have a big uh, installation base for those uh, you know, testing equipment out there, right? So we are uh, actually in the process, right? And to building, providing a lot of those, uh, uh, the connectivity 
and also the edge compute capability. That's the, uh, the infrastructure we are building for the, the data superhighway. In, in the same time, we are partnering with those ecosystem partners, right? Provide the, the standard you know, API interface, right? So they don't need to worry about, hey, at a different stage of the fabrication process, right? I have to deal with different uh, you know, equipment. What is the right API? Um, and how do I collect those data? And then, you know, so they can be our partner, they can focus, right, on what they do the best, where they are developing those, uh, you know, the analytic solution, right, providing those, uh, you know, uh, those innovation on top of those uh, standard, you know, data, you know, API, where they have access to those uh, data warehouse, data lake kind of information, and they can just, uh, you know, process those, uh, drive, spend more time driving the insights instead of us worry about getting the infrastructure, right? And uh, worry about how to get those data. I think those are the things we are doing uh, to help to, uh, you know, to improve the, uh, uh, the speed of innovation. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, the one last, uh, last topic uh, for the panel discussion, uh, the, I think it's about risk five. Uh, risk five, uh, as Ted has uh, 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 said, he has been 16 times uh, promoting it uh, in the speech. Uh, actually, Caspar, we have been hosting uh, the risk five topic since 2016. Uh, I think at that time, we invited sci fi founders, uh, CTOs, uh, uh, as well spoke. Um, so, the first question will start with uh, Ted. Uh, what is the challenge now you see that remaining challenge for the risk five to succeed? And what will be the a killer app for risk five? Yeah, I, I guess I ask myself tough questions as well. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the success. So, RISC V is is a uh, it's a it's a disruptive technology. It's it's not in the ISA necessarily, but in in the in the business model. So we are trying. We're a key pillar in opening up hardware development, uh, but that it's a, a different. Uh, different business models. So when the x86 was coming along, you had the PC industry, Intel and Microsoft were making all the money and they could afford to build out their ecosystem, uh, uh, you know, completely on their own. Uh, you know, ARM came along uh, and definitely had a killer app, enabled the killer app, uh, uh, really, with, the, with the, uh, uh, the mobile industry. But they, they were not making nearly as much profit as Intel was. Because they were basically selling IP to you know lots lots of implementers, but they had enough big companies uh, with the uh, killer app uh, mobile, you know, focused on uh, building that ecosystem up. And so you know, ARM had help because of the killer app funding, I guess, the a lot of the uh, ARM ecosystem work. So here we are with RISC Five. Uh, I kind of alluded to our strategy and it was talked about earlier. I mean, what's you know, where do you unique position to take advantage, since we're open, take advantage of the, you know, all the university brain power uh, that exists uh, throughout the world, extremely smart people and professors and researchers. Uh, and so we're, we're definitely trying to uh, uh, recruit them to the job of, of building out the, uh, helping us build out the job of the RISC-V ecosystem, you know, with, uh, you know, we want them partnering with, with, with uh, you know, uh, you know, professionals as well. So it's not just kids that are uh, uh, doing this work. It's it's industry leaders like uh, Dr. Bao at the Chinese Academy of Science, for example. Uh, so uh, so getting people developed. So I think we've already started that uh, uh, growth or, or or started tapping into that uh, angle of 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 helping you know do all the heavy lifting necessary to bring us up up to speed. Uh, so and I think. As uh, companies, you know, you know, trailing along right now is is, is big companies making money off Risk Five, where Risk Five is existential to their survival. So we're we're not there yet, but as 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 we get there, and the company will, you know, those big companies will also start uh, uh, pitching in a lot. And I think you know, Intel definitely uh, uh, is is going to be a, a big help in that dimension. But so kind of linking the questions together, you know, it, it would it would help a lot to have a, a, a killer app for RISC-V. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think anyone could predict uh, what that is, but I, I can kind of describe 
uh, some qualities of it. So, you know, part of my uh, talk today, uh, first of all, was to plant in people's brain that you uh, you want to build uh, equipment with RISC V and uh, uh, you know, lots of RISC Vs. I think the vectors uh, ISA is can be an element in in uh, uh, stepping up to the plate when the killer app. Uh, does arrive, uh, you know, ARM has a, 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 a vector processor part of their ISA as well. So we're, but we're kind of, you know, we're not coming from behind there so much. Uh, so, so I think, you know, definitely hoping uh, uh, people realize the value and, 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 and the, uh, of the RISC-V vector ISA and we'd get, uh, you know, everyone, uh, uh, you know, starting to use that. I really want uh, those to become the kind of the transistor of of uh, the you know the the next level of compute, and then the innovation is using those transistors. So uh, the killer app uh, to be a true killer app, you know, the PC business was uh, a, a massive app that got computing in you know a lot of households. People were buying computers. But the mobile. Uh, I think by any measure, I've done, done looked at some numbers. Is ten times bigger, twenty times bigger? If you if you look at all the profits that Apple's making, Verizon's making, all these people are just make, making massive amounts of money uh, off the mobile app uh, uh, or, or out of mobile. And so every to the point where almost every person in the world has one of these phones, and and the, every person is paying a bill. So the the the, the you know how do we beat that? So a, a, a a killer app should be 10x bigger. The next killer app should be somehow be 10x bigger uh, than, than mobile. Uh, mm. So uh, it's going to be, it's a, it's a challenge, but you know, now I'm going to go, mm. go really out on an edge and uh, you know, got to get all these machines to start uh, making their own money and, and, and buying the next generation of software themselves. <laughs> so if yeah. you want to, I don't know if that's a dystopic thought or not, but. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, that uh, yeah, you're yeah, being a make, make a much a very big uh, projection. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we do. Yeah, I think we do see well, like in, in, in it's probably the uh, evolution ongoing. Uh, yeah. So I like to uh, also want to hear from the uh, others. Uh, what do you share with um, uh, uh, Ted's uh, projection? <laughs> Anyone thought uh, had had uh, thoughts about uh, what takes Wix Fire to succeed and what will be the potential? Um, Killer app. This is Rob. I was going to say an important Can you email aspect. it to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, an important aspect, of course, is building a software ecosystem around RISC V, a robust software ecosystem. And I know this from uh, what I saw at uh, Oracle relative to Spark is yeah. that having a robust software ecosystem, the libraries, uh, compilers, uh, eventually into the applications is the key aspect of making any architecture successful. But I will say that the openness of RISC-V and the collaborative mm -hmm. nature of its innovation is what's going to help guarantee its success. You, a company or a person can adopt the architecture and generate an implementation without worries of uh, other ramifications or licensing ramifications, if you will, right? In fact, you know, so I, I do chat with uh, Mark Kevelstein monthly, uh, you know, as we do collaborate with RISC-V, uh, obviously, or not obviously, but we do. Uh, and, you know, I asked him one time, I said, gee, Mark, do you know all the case use cases of where RISC v is instantiated or can you, I was just kind of curious, you know, how if it was always built as an ASIC or as a built as a custom, semi-custom, just kind of under, want to understand the implementation. And he said, I really don't know. It's used in so many places, I don't know. He, he, he couldn't really quantify entirely that for me. So I just thought it was rather interesting and also a testament to the uh, widespread adoption of RISC-V, so. Hmm. I, all right. Hey, thank you. Thank you, uh, Rob and Ted on the topic. Uh, I think finally, uh, the we uh, take a, a question, two questions from uh, from the from the audience. I think one is the technical question is pretty specific, and the other one is non-technical. Uh, so the 
technical question is that uh, what are the issues with chip-to-chip -chip communications uh, in the multi-chip package? Anyone? What do you see as the issues for chip-to-chip -chip communica communications? Uh, well, I me... think what... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, Please. go ahead, Iran. No, I was just going to say, I think the aspect that uh, with AIB and now the uh, subsequent follow-on partnership, I can't recall the, the name, so folks help me please. But uh, I think the fact that the protocol and the underlying electrical aspects of the interface has been defined, I think that goes a long way relative to addressing some of the concerns. I know that in the case of a number of design teams, uh, defining that type of thing is, uh, is is a challenge. So having that being donated to the community, if you will, as an open source standard is a huge benefit. Okay. Yeah, that AIB oh, has gone mean. through several generations. Uh, so it is, it is proven and battle tested and uh, pretty impressive solving problems of power bandwidth and uh, latency. So I think okay. that's the least of the problems and getting it to uh, take off. Mm. Wait, I, would, yeah, anything yeah. To... I would say at this stage, uh, there are actually multiple technologies available uh, to enable the chip to chip. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of the topics showed up here, I think at this point, the industry most needed is actually uh, industry standardization of the interface, which is what what's happening today. Once that one is there, I think the next step we're going to be built on top of that platform. It was going to be tremendous progress starting at this point, which is good to see. Uh, that said, uh, I'm really talking about existing technology. There's plenty of space in for IND, for example, in optical interconnected space, which is also chip to chip technology. That space is not there yet. Okay. All right. Hey, thank you. I think one last question from the audience is non technical. This is for Rob that uh, he has seen uh, 40 years' experience. What are the common uh, attributes you see that successful engineering leaders? I think after Rob, you could, uh, 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 Matt of us could speak to this too. Uh, we'll start with one, Rob. So the question was, what are the attributes of a successful engineering leader? That's right. Oh, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I wish I knew the answer to that. Uh, but anyway, I will, uh, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, first off, I would say is remain humble, no matter uh, where you are in your career, because, uh, Failure is just around the co corner and success is fleeting. I think that's the first aspect. Uh, the other thing is to always listen to your, uh, your team. And you know your team may be of uh, varying backgrounds, right? Both in terms of engineering education, right? But your team else may also include people such as legal or human resources, right? Or you know, procurement. Right, I, I certainly learned that in my experience at Oracle that I worked with a very broad team and each individual of those teams had valuable perspectives. So I think being able to take that information in and reason it and then ask appropriate questions hopefully lead to the right decisions being made both from an engineering and a business perspective. Okay, yeah, I think it's more uh, uh, the uh, uh, anyone else want to add? What do you see uh, that you have been in industry long enough? What do you see as the uh, the uh, ad, ad, uh, the attributes uh, to the successful engineering leader? Anyone else yes. to, to yeah, add? Yeah, so related to being humble, uh, you want you want you want smarter people working for you. Uh, so so you don't want to be the smartest guy. You want the smartest people working for you. I think that that's actually crucial. Uh, so. Uh, and I mean that that's how that, that's how you can uh, lead get get smarter people around you yeah and maybe one thing I'll add here is uh, technology world is definitely very very competitive um, so make sure you find the stuff that you're passionate about and have fun with it mm. yeah. Michael that's great advice stuff? I mean yeah I mean, I, I've enjoyed, <laughs> I've enjoyed my job. So that's like hugely important. You spend at least a third of your life doing it. So, yeah. yeah. Michael, any thoughts on the topic? Uh, 
yeah so 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 well anyway so i just want to you know uh make some you know uh good uh, you know uh, conclusion here is that again i i see that the uh, yeah i mean the uh the semiconductor industry definitely there's a, a lots of the uh you know uh, opportunity you know uh, here for the innovation right and and uh, i mean I, I really you know kind of enjoying the uh, uh all the uh, other speakers uh, talk today and, and uh, hopefully that uh, you know with those uh, you know um the collective wisdom right i think uh, we can you know working together right to make the more innovation right and especially one thing uh, there's one aspect I, I forget to share um to uh you know in, in my uh, you know, a presentation there is that, uh, you know, a lot of people is asking uh, how to, um, you know, uh, address the, uh, the, the the global shortage of the, the, the semiconductor, right? And especially that, uh, you know, um, nowadays that uh, it, it's, a, it's a big problem. I mean, other than increasing the capacity, right? I think, uh, how can we do that, right? And uh, I'm facing this type of issue, right? On a daily basis, right? Not just uh, from, uh, the, the customers that I'm talking on a daily basis, but also from the uh, advantage of actually our internal supply, right? And specifically, you know, what we're doing is that uh, um, how can we actually, you know, uh, increase the, you know, the equipment, you know, uh, utilization, including the uh, production engineering efficiency, improving the yield, uh, or increase, increasing those, uh, you know, production, you know, throughput, right? Those are the things that, uh, you know, um, it's 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 a it's a big question that the industry, you know, um, are you know struggling and uh, you know and have to deal with right on a daily basis, right? Um, and uh, so what we see particular beneficial, right? To to actually I any mean, with the uh, uh, you know the uh, applying the AI and the machine learning, what we see in particular benefit is that uh, using those uh, uh, you know a lot of these advanced techniques, right? For example. We do this, uh, you know, uh, adaptive testing, right? Or, or improving this uh, inline, you know, outlier detection, um, or doing this, uh, you know, uh, a lot of this, uh, you know, guided uh, kind of analytics kind of techniques, right? We are seeing that, uh, you know, not just uh, for the customer, right? But also inside the advantage, right? Because uh, we are seeing that, that there's a the big backlog and the customer are just keep pushing. How can I increase those uh, throughput and efficiency? And uh, what actually makes me feel that uh, you know uh, has a sense of this kind of uh, achievement? I think it's not just on the uh, you know on the business. Actually, um, from the technology and also the uh, manufacturing efficiency, I'm seeing that uh, with those uh, uh, AI analytics, right, uh, we were able actually be able to see some sig significant improvement. From those, uh, you know, throughput, right? From the uh, uh, manufacturing and the yield, right? And this is actually yeah. uh, what actually makes me feel excited and keep me motivated. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, hey. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Michael, to share your personal chat. The. Uh, I think right now for the. Uh, this is a great topic, and we have a great lineup of uh, the speakers. It's very hard for me to. Uh, let go. Uh, we could spend hours chatting. Right. We can spend years. Uh, the working on the future technology trends, uh, uh, but uh, uh, sadly we have to conclude our panel discussion today. Uh, that uh, uh, there's only certain things. Our time is up, uh, and I uh, again uh, greatly appreciate uh, all of you to join the uh, our, our speakers remain and join the panel discussion. And I appreciate the CASPA symposium team uh, to uh, it's a well organized event. Uh, at this point, I have to pass the uh, this uh, the uh, uh, back to uh, the William. Hey, thank you, guys.